Hello, welcome to episode three. Thank you for showing up today, this Tuesday morning, the best place to be on a Tuesday morning. Uh, building off of last week, we're gonna learn from others, others who have walked the path before us that can provide insight to innovation, to creativity, to scaling, to entrepreneurship, and how we can learn from those who've gone before us. So today we have a special guest who has deep experience uh, with running and directing a new venture, I would call it, that was embedded within an organization. So much like in our scalability class, we learned the many approaches that organizations use to innovate, one of them being incubating ideas and new ventures internally. And we had something very similar here at USF in a, this non-for-profit realm. And our guests will be able to, uh, Dr. Ben Smet will be sharing his experiences um, with his approach to try to scale open, which was the new venture, the open partnership education network uh, within an organization, which has its own challenges, uh, own challenges, not on, only because it's within an organization, but because it's a non-for-profit and it's because in an educational space with head, which has hierarchy and, and challenges as well. But before we break and give Ben the floor, uh, let's do a warm up. And I've invited my friend and colleague, Christine Alexander, to kick us off with some warm up with Improv for Innovation. So, Christine, the virtual floor is yours. Well, thank you. Hello. Good morning. My name is Christine Alexander. This is applause, a silent applause. It's for, yes, thank you, Ben. Um, it's actually sign language. Alexander, I'm Improv. We're going to do some you know that anything that you do is absolutely perfect. Okay, so if I ask you to make a noise and you go, I don't know, it's the perfect, I don't know, you've ever done in your entire life. Okay, I'm committed to providing a very safe and courageous place. So if at any time you don't feel safe or courageous, just don't do it. It's okay. <laughs> so what we're going to do is uh, just shake out our body. We're going to shake out one arm eight times, then the other arm eight times. Then we're going to go real slow with our body eight times. Then we're going to tap a foot eight times. Then the other foot eight times. We'll start all over. Do it four, 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 two, two, two. If you're lost, it doesn't matter. Just shake your body. We're going to count out loud. We're on mute, so it's okay. Here we go. One, two, three, one, two, four, three five, four, six, five, seven, six, eight. seven, eight. One, two, one, two three, two, four, three, five. Four, See there, your teachers are sillier than you are. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, um, now let's uh, turn on our microphones so we can play a uh, verbal game. Uh, you don't have to show us your faces if you don't want to, uh, but I do want to hear you. The number one tenet of improv is yes and. We agree with each other. And then we add information so that the our partner is inspired. So we're each going to tell a story uh, as like one brain, okay? Um, I think, how's the order here? Can you see, uh, it's different for everybody? I don't know, I'll, we'll just, I'll call you out. Um, when it's your turn, you're going to either say yes and, or yes, but whichever one's next. I'll say yes, and and then Steve will say yes, but then Ben, you're going to say yes, and and then Marshall, yes, but Oliver, yes, and Graham, yes, but William, yes, and Alyssa, yes, but <laughs> here we go. Here's a story. Um, yes, and I was gifted a trip to the Adirondacks. Yes, but. You were crammed in a small cabin with 20 other people to get there. Yes, Dan, but, you know, yes, and but, we were crammed in there, but, and we had a great time. I think that was an and, so the next person should be a but. 
Yes, right. Marshall. Yes, but you did great. Yes, but it was snowing outside all day. Yes, and Oliver. Yes, yes but Graham. Yes, but I had a nice toasty down jacket with some hot cocoa. Yes, and William. Yes, and Alyssa. Yes, and um, I was waiting for a yes, but, but whatever. Um, yes, and. <laughs> yes, that's awesome. Right there. Just do that. Listen, it's okay, right? All we're doing is warming up our little brains. And of course, we're going to be like, yeah, it's the morning. You're perfect. Everything was great. Now, let's just do uh, another game called last word, first word. I'm going to say a sentence. My last word is going to be Steve's first word. Benjamin, his last word in his sentence is going to be your first word, and we'll go around the circle. It doesn't have to make sense, but we are recording, so if it's amazing, we'll sell it on eBay. Okay, here we go. Twice yesterday, I went outside and saw kittens. Kittens. Kittens are so cute and lovable and cuddly. Cuddly, 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 cuddly. I love them so much. I pet them, but I still prefer dogs. Marshall. Marshall. Dogs. Whoop, sorry. Dogs are terrible. I hate them. <laughs> Graham, them. Or Oliver, I see you. Oliver, them. Um... The, I don't even know how to start a sentence with them. Um, true. Them dogs. Uh, Marshall does not like them. Yes, that's awesome. So, Graham, you also have them. Then people keep tossing this word them around. <laughs> Alyssa, around. Around the room. It went, <laughs> but I'm so glad I didn't get them. <laughs> Thank you. You guys, thank you for just sorry, guys. doing it with me. How, why are you kidding? There's no sorry in improv. That, that was amazing. You're awesome. Thank you for having me. Have a wonderful time. Let's give Christine a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you friends. <laughs> Bye. For warming us up. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Ben Smet. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for being here and spending the morning with us. <clears throat> Today, we have students from three of my courses, Creativity and Innovation, Scalability, and a Student Consulting Design Thinking course. And I know you have a lot of experience in this area and many different capabilities. Um, so I just wanted to ask, what have you been up to since we've been able to uh, connect? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, well, first of all, let me comment on that, that little wake up. Um, you know, I'm a I'm a jazz guy. I play trumpet. You see my music collection back here. I named my first son Miles after Miles Davis. That was a fight with his mother, by the way. She didn't want that name. And the reason I liked Miles so much, he there's a, actually a famous jazz improv story with him. He was known to be one of the legends of jazz. And um, if you're not familiar with jazz, and one of his players that used to play with Herbie Hancock was a piano player. And it's a story on leadership, actually, that really struck me early in my life. I got to be exposed to it early. And Herbie Hancock tells a story. Um, he was playing one of his first gigs with Miles Davis, and he was, like, really nervous to be playing with the great. And in the sets, he made a mistake by hitting the wrong chord, as far as the song was concerned. Like, it was supposed to be a, a G, G flat, and he went to an A or something. And what he, what he tells late now in life and story in terms of leadership and improv and why it's so important is it's not so much for the person who's on that, that end, like what we just were, we were on the receiving end feeling uncomfortable. But he says what he learned from that moment was Miles Davis didn't skip a beat because he was so practiced and, and so creative and just constantly challenging himself. When Herbie Hancock hit the wrong note, 
Miles Davis just riffed off of that and kept playing the song in a different key. And that lesson always stuck with me because I look at leadership, I look at improv, it's not so much, and that's why I wanted to start practicing it myself, get out of my own comfort zone, because if I found out it was less about me and more about the team that I was on. If I could get good at improv and be good at creativity, then the team I've assembled to help with my ventures and my initiatives, if they make a mistake or they're, you know, it's just not clicking, that's okay. Right. And I'm okay with it because I'm gonna find a different key to play and, and, and rip off of that person's strengths. That lesson struck with me. So this was fun. I, I, I didn't know we were gonna do that, but sorry for that tangent, but I just thought I'd share that because it was a valuable lesson I learned earlier in my life. Oh, we can't hear you. Yeah, you're muted. Cool. Uh, so some of the skills that the students are learning in these courses are the idea of research, how to make research, how to analyze research, how to present it in the form of a story. This iterative process of developing the presentation, um, how to create vision for others to follow, how to enroll people and persuade them. And I know you've had a few ventures both within an organization and a few things that you're working on now. Maybe you could speak to what role some of these play or how they panned out in terms of uh, running a venture within an organization or trying to understand your target market. Yeah, what a great question. You know, Steve, this was something that I didn't, I wish I had a class like yours back in the day because it's absolutely something I really didn't quite fathom. I've always, I've been blessed with a lot of skills and, and most of which is outgoing. I'm not really shy. So, you know, doing improv or something has been, and so I, I kind of, early in my life, I over relied on that. And so the first couple of ventures I tried to sell, um, so to speak, to potential partners and people I was trying to get excited I really relied on the passion of the, what I was thinking. And that gets you to a certain extent. It gets you, certainly even me, in my case, it got my foot in the door, it gave me access because I wasn't shy. But when I finally got to a level here at the university um, with Open, and now I'm in front of the big decision makers, the ones that have been doing this a long, long time, I was, I, I was basically um, shamed. <laughs> Because I came into one of my first, uh, you know, pitches, just relying completely on my in, my my um, creativity and my enthusiasm. And when it became to the day, and they started asking me about this concept, and like just simple, I mean, talking simple things like, what's the market size you're thinking, and and what's the segment you're looking for, you're looking to target, and. I didn't have a clue. I hadn't thought about those things, or I had thought about them, but I had kind of was like, eh, I don't need to spend a lot of time there. I'm just going to sell them on my energy and passion. And so um, I've had to adapt it over time. And and at first, it was it was um, it was no fun because the re research isn't very fun. Even though I've done my doctorate now and I had to muscle my way through it, I it's not something I thoroughly enjoy, even for a venture I'm passionate about. But I will say that it's gotten easier. Like because I, because I had that hard lesson early in my my um, in my in my uh, tenure. Thank goodness, thank goodness. And it was a wake up call, and I worked at it. Now, when I go to a meeting, not only do I still have my energy and enthusiasm that I can kind of lean on to get people's excitement in, in my storytelling, but when they ask the good questions, I have the answers. And I found that was the secret to really sealing the deal, actually, and more, more often than not. In many cases, some of these really higher ups, they actually get a little um, bit turned off if you come into rah, rah. You know, they just want the facts. Give me the numbers. Give me the facts. And I actually have found that to be more the case. The more you get in front of people that have been doing this a long time, because they get so many pitches, you know, I have found to just keep shortening my story and get, just get to the essence. And then give them the facts, give them the details, which I, when I was younger and I was starting off, it was so counterintuitive to me because I thought I could just sell them on my idea. Does that answer your question? 
Absolutely. But in order to distill, you have to be able to understand what is relevant and what isn't and say this research or this trend or this is important and this isn't. So it's this idea of being comfortable or being familiar enough with the material that you can say, here's the bottom line facts that yeah. add to the story, that add to the argument that you're trying to make. And we're going through that process. And most of my students have to present three or four times throughout the semester to refine that process, to refine that skill. Because not all research is important, not e all research and data is equal. And learning to be able to discern what is and what isn't or where it falls in the narrative or in your story or in your argument is important. So yeah. I know, and this is directly addressing the students who have already asked some questions. So the students are gonna be making their third presentation and it's gonna be their midterm presentation. And you go, is this a new presentation or is this the same as the old one? And I'm, I don't quite understand that question. What I wanna share is you need to create a new presentation that is well refined with all the research that you've been doing, including since the last presentation, to make a well-crafted research presentation that identifies the opportunities and gaps at the end, which is where you will exploit eventually the solution that you build on the second half of the semester. So it's not a question of, is this new or old? You're taking the research you've already done. So in that sense, it's already old. Build on the stuff that you, the new stuff and research that you've done to make a whole new, better presentation. Because in general, what Ben talked about in terms of distilling it down to the essence and the data and the big points, we're not there yet. Most of us are, it's too gobbled up. I can't even, it's not comprehensible. And so it's only through this refinement, through this iteration, through this prototyping and presenting that it becomes a logical story. So that is the point of the midterm. So the midterm is really what normally would be the first draft for people who have these types of skills. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I like to yeah, I like to call it um, revisioning, refining and revisioning. And I tell you what, guys, um, this wasn't easy. This was not an easy concept to for me to grasp, especially as a as a cocky, arrogant, um, you know, kind of well, not arrogant, but I was cocky and kind of fooling myself and thinking I had all the answers. So it was really hard for me to get feedback. <laughs> So, um, but what I found I needed uh, and I benefited from and I finally got over and I grew thick skin and I grew in a, an ability to really listen to what people were trying to tell. I think the real aha moment for me, Steve, was realizing I didn't have, when it came down to, I had to, when I figured out I, I had to research this and really get to the answers and I didn't find that to be very fun. That wasn't the fun part of it for me. I, I, Thankfully, I had a teacher kind of like you. I didn't have this kind of class, but I had one like you who helped guide me into a, you know, figuring out, well, who did I know? What relationships did I have that had a skill set that was complementary to mine that I could bounce ideas off of and help steer me in the right direction and, um, and get some of my research questions answered? And the first time I set out to do that with those partners, it was really difficult because I was not very, very well versed in those areas. And so a lot of what they were telling me was pretty harsh, kind of like, hey, man, you don't know you got to do this? Like, okay, you know? And I was like, whoa. But the more I really listened to them and they helped steer me on how to, how to navigate that, it became fun. I was like, oh, these are why you need those answers. This is why you need to think about this. And by the way, and this was the biggest lesson learned for me, Steve, it's not all up to me. I don't know of any really real ventures or, or anything I've ever done has never been me by myself. I've always done it in partnership with others. Um, I, and so working in that space, it's easier to revision, right? So I've got a, my pitch deck. I never, ever, ever, ever go show my pitch deck to the person it matters to, you know, the person I'm trying to get money from, or in your case, to the professor until I've like run it by a lot of other people and say, Hey man, poke some holes in it. Tell me where I'm going wrong. You know, what are your, what are the questions you have? And the first few times I did that, it was not easy because I was getting beaten. I felt like a punching bag, you know? Um, but the more I did it, uh, what, here was my first lesson into my first, um, 
um, uh, appreciation of why it was important. After I went through that process and I went to the pitch, um, and this was when I started my doctorate work, actually, on military to veterans transition. And I went to pitch this to uh, U.S. Congressman Gus Bilirakis, who was the vice chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee for the U.S. House of Representatives at the time. Um, we were in a meeting with about 15 other vets, and I had like a, maybe 30 seconds to kind of lean in when I, it was my turn to talk. The old Ben would have re relied on that, like, hey, we got to do this and rah, rah, rah. But this time I had already been practicing in my head exactly what I wanted to say, why I needed to say it. I had bounced off with some trusted friends who helped me distill. And I said, sir, nearly three, and I'd done the research from the University of Southern California that said nearly three quarters of all veterans we uh, feel, uh, feel, this is several years ago now, so I have to come back to it. Nearly three quarters of us feel disconnected from civilian life. We're not all combat. And I gave this one of those drop the mic moments, but with data. And, and he pulled me aside afterwards and asked me to head up a task force for him on this. And so it was right after I had practiced for the first time, you know, now I'm a doctoral student. So you guys are getting this as an undergrad. It's amazing to me. Um, but as my, as I started my doctorate, I had people help me figure out what was the important research questions. And then I coupled that with my energy and enthusiasm to seal the deal. Next thing I know, they're flying me up to DC monthly to brief the Veterans Affairs Committee on this stuff. But, and then I had to really do the research because <laughs> now my foot's in the door and they're looking to me for answers, but I wouldn't have even gotten that opportunity just because of my energy and my passion alone. If I hadn't had the French, the friends and the mentors and the partners to help me guide through the research, I never would have even gotten that opportunity. Good. I'd like to pivot the conversation to uh, something that's related. So my students are working on a project that deals with a civic engagement. And that speaks to this idea of getting primary re research. And many of the students in the past, I don't know how many in this current cohort, have gone out and talked to city council members or mayors about the topics that they're interested in. I know so some are talking about interested in, in water pollution, some are interested in traffic, some are interested in, um, um, uh, I think, uh, beach erosion, other things. And while we can do our research in second hand through Google and different in um, uh, the libraries and, the, and different databases, going out to find firsthand what the community wants and through our elective officials, you know, I know you have a lot of experience with that, doing that within open and even yeah. your, your example with the Veterans Affairs. What type of experience was that and how did that help, you know, guide either the thematic development within open or get a feel or temperature of what was actually the feel in the community if those topics were important or the problem or challenge was important because that's where i would really like to drive the students to go out there and meet with the council members to see if the assumptions that they're researching hold with what's actually happening in practice in society yeah well you know steve it's crucial i mean it's, it's absolutely crucial if you're trying to be on the cutting edge of solving problems, you gotta, it's one thing to have the context and the background and, and definitely wanna know the historical trends and you wanna know, you know, Google's fine. You wanna get some background data. So when you go meet with them, you kind of sound like you know what you're talking about at least. That's all important, but there's no substitute speaking to the people that are on the front lines right now, you know, whether it's military, <laughs> Uh, first responders, um, community members, activists, government officials, because they're the ones actually doing the work right now. So their opinion, I found, which is counterintuitive to me back in the day, I thought if I just knew enough of the statistics, um, then with my that coupled with my energy and enthusiasm and passion would be enough. But what I found really took me to the next level was when I interfaced with the actual officials and the people doing the work that I was interested in working in. Now, of course, you know, let me say, I, I understand it's easier for me because I'm pretty outgoing and I'm not shy. So I would walk right up to Mayor Kreisman and say, good afternoon, Mr. Kreis Mayor Kreisman. You know, I'm Benjamin Smed. I want to meet, you know. So I know I have that advantage, but if I didn't, 
you better be you better be certain I would find a partner that would that has that skill set, right? If I was the so my partners have always been the ones who like were the shyer ones and that helped do the research and helped me kind of like think through the right questions asked, and then they would rely on me to go break the ice. So I know what it's like also to be in that other side if you're if you're shy and you're just you're you're an introvert and it's and it's it's difficult to imagine going up to a mayor and interacting with them, especially cold call. I, I you know, I know that's p- terrifying. I, I can I saw it in my partner's faces. Um, but that was my value add, right? So finding those partners, I think, uh, Steve, to your point, it's crucial to get the uh, insights, this research, this first person research. And if you don't have the, you know, the kind of the, p- the skill set or the extrovert nature to do it, find a partner that does. And it's always more powerful to go in twos. You know, you have, you, you, now I'm in those circles um, and, and uh, I get invited to DC quite a bit. I see other newbies coming in and I see them come in, in singles. And they're always more shy and they're, they sit in the corner and they don't really participate. The ones that roll up to Congress in twos or threes, they're more, they just, you know, it's like tribe mentality, your tribe, your, your partnership. So you overcome some of those barriers or challenges to asking the questions when you, when you come as a team already, and you've already vetted the questions with each other and you've already thought through a strategy on how you'll interact. It doesn't always work out, but at least you, you tried. Good, good tip. This is a very good tip for our students because, in fact, many of you are interested in solving the same challenges. So you could go together virtually, whatever, through social media, meet with city council members, with the mayor, because some of you I know are interested in the water pollution. Some of you are interested in traffic. So you could do it collectively. You could come up with a list. You can come up with different angles for the question. And then you're driving this first person uh, and primary data research, and you can really get a feel to know and validate, is your topic really that important? And is that what Mayor Kreisman and the city council members hearing from their constituents? And you, if you do that across different uh, districts and different um, city council members, Tampa or St. Pete, because remember, we're, we're, fa- we're challenged with a, a Tampa Bay issue, it doesn't necessarily need to be just St. Pete, but you can start seeing how well, in Tampa, that's not really the conversation, or in St. Pete it is, or vice versa, or what districts or whatever. And you can find maybe an area where to prototype or where there's support, where to push your ideas. I would like to pivot again the conversation to the idea of trying to enroll people in your vision or trying to persuade people or the challenges, particularly because not all my students will go and start their business from day one, or I know some of them have that. But some of them will go into industry and learn from from others, and some will find different paths. Maybe you can speak a bit about trying to be uh, a trailblazer, an innovator in in an organization um, that might be very heavily structured or heavily hierarchy, and uh, you know, a very traditional, top-down organization. And you're a venture that speaks the complete opposite of decentralized, of networks, of using wisdom of crowds, this bottom-up approach to innovation, and a very much this hacker and, and Silicon Valley type of mentality. Yeah. And what was the experience in these very different types of environments? And yeah, wow. Well, uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm one of those that have now had the experience in both settings. And let me tell you, um, many ways there's a lot of similarities because to be innovative to be disruptive requires a certain amount of chutzpah and conviction and 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 creativity creativity big time i think every slot every slide deck i create every pitch deck every business plan everything that i'm creating i always think of it as inversions i you know of course when i get it actually in front of the decision maker I want it to be as refined as possible, but I think it helps the mindset when I look at the whole thing as revisioning. I'm just constantly revisioning. I'm constantly getting feedback. I'm going to partners. I'm finding new partners. And I'm just, and then I keep doing that up until like I'm ready to go there. And now, and the reason, there's two reasons that's important, Steve. 
Because when you're in front of the decision makers, you never know for sure what they're going to ask. You could be as prepared as you think, you know, you're like, oh, man, I got this nailed. And inevitably, they throw a curveball at you, which is another reason I, I would go one step further, Steve, and say it's vital that you go into – have a buddy. There's just confidence in having somebody there and knowing them so well that if you don't have the answer, you can kind of look to your buddy. And then if they're just feeling more confident about that section, they can – so you don't – the energy die, right? Because energy is important. But to your point about whether it's in um, a tradition, non-traditional startup or an institution like we work at USF, um, now you're talking politics, right? Now you're talking not just your idea, and it's maybe disruptiveness to the very institution you're in, and then trying to navigate that, right? And helping them, and then it's, a, it's teaching. Now it's that's why you really got to be on your game and understand the context and the research and the problem. I mean, every good business plan starts with the problem you're trying to solve. You got to have a really good understanding of that problem and all the potential solutions, and be okay with if there's a solution that the institution um, thinks might be a better course. You have to have that. You have to have that negotiation, right? Constant negotiation. But if you already go in with the mindset. That the whole venture is you're revisioning, you're refining, you're tr- but you're focused on trying to solve the problem. Even in the institutional setting, you can hold the higher ground. I was a director of this program, which in a hierarchy of an institution is still pretty low. That's like middle management, right? And so I was kind of tables with the decision makers, and and I had to have the confidence to go, folks, you're losing sight of the problem. The problem we're trying to solve is this. But I wouldn't have had that confidence if I hadn't done the research and understood really fundamentally what the problem was. Good. Uh, I'd like to open the question and the floor to two questions from the students. Um, does anyone anyone uh, have a question for, for Ben um, or ideas or clarifications? Uh, I didn't necessarily have a question. I'll just raise my hand because the... Uh... While he was talking, it was super static. He was hard to hear. Okay. Mm, I, I didn't shoot. know if that was just my, but uh, it was coming in and out a little bit, but it was okay. Sorry. Sorry, guys. All right. All right. Last question. If you could give yourself, your younger self advice, would there be one piece or two pieces of advice that you would give your younger self knowing that there's a cohort that's going to be graduating soon. They've been given the tools of what they need to, to succeed, uh, both as a business owner, a creator, an innovator, and or within an uh, Knowing your experience and reflecting back, would there be one or two pieces of advice that you would give your younger self? What would that be? Yeah. Um, yeah absolutely. I, I, I think I think the main thing, if I had to do it over again, that I would have um, worked on a little bit harder. Um, and just your point about research, Steve. This one was really not intuitive to me, not because partly because I didn't enjoy it. Um, <laughs> so it's not fun. It still isn't very fun. But I have partners now to help me through it, so it's more fun. Um, Understanding the value of that earlier on, I would. I sometimes reflect on. How much for, I feel like I'm having a lot of success. I'm going to D.C. to Congress is asking me to come test starting this new venture. I'm being cons- people are asking for consulting and asking me to help them start up there. So I mean, I've gotten to a place where I, I've, I'm I'm good. I'm happy. I'm I'm having fun. But I, I sometimes think if I had taken that part a little bit more seriously earlier on. Would some of my earlier ventures been more successful? Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Cool. Wonderful. Uh, I want to say thank you for spending our morning with us. Uh, if we can give Ben a big round of applause and um, thank you for your wisdom and, and sharing. Thank you. I'm going to pivot to our Q&A for our project. So you're welcome to stay, Ben, if you want, or we can catch up soon. But I'm going to stop the recording and then we'll talk about our projects. Cool. 
Well, hey, good 